Hello there students, thank you for being part of this presentation today. My name is Luis Silva and I am your history teacher and today we're going to be looking at U.S. history and the American Revolution, basically the years 1775 to 1783. Following the battles of Lexington and Concord, the Second Continental Congress met in May 1775 in the city of Philadelphia. They realized that there were divisions among the colonists. Uh, some colonists wanted to declare independence and others felt that there was no need to become independent but instead to work things out with Great Britain. But the Second Continental Congress was able to organize the Continental Army and they appointed George Washington as the Commander-in-Chief of the military. This is one of the reasons why George Washington actually became the first president because he had gained prominence throughout the U.S. Revolutionary War. The Battle of Bunker Hill took place in June 1775 in which the British basically were able to take the hill. But colonists were able to hold their own, and because of this particular incident, this particular battle, this built a whole bunch of confidence in the mindset of many of the colonists, and they felt that they can actually compete with Great Britain and actually fight with Great Britain. But then again, there was this feeling among many colonists that they did not want to fight Great Britain. As you may know, Great Britain is the mother country or was the mother country. So an olive branch was actually sent to King George III. This olive branch petition basically tried to get the king, in this case the British king, to come with terms with the colonists. But unfortunately, the king dismissed the olive branch petition and declared the colonists in rebellion. It is very important for you to know that in 1775, there was no clear consensus for independence yet, but this consensus slowly started to become part of the colonists when they saw that Great Britain was not willing to cooperate with the colonists. Now, let's look at some of the roots of the revolutionary feelings in the, the United States or in the 13 colonies. First, we need to look at Enlightenment ideas. As you may recall, Enlightenment ideas were those ideas about how can a government best protect and serve people. In this case, you have two individuals that are very important. On one hand, you have John Locke, and uh, on the other hand, you have Rousseau. And uh, these two individuals strongly influence the colonists. Locke said that everyone has natural rights, and the power of government is derived from popular consent. So we're looking at two big things. Everybody has natural rights. And at the same time, the government is there because the people have given the government the power. Another important individual here is also Thomas Paine. In his pamphlet, Common Sense, he argued for independence. Obviously, this was a radical idea at this time. And many people actually did not like it. They felt that there was no need to become independent from Great Britain. But Thomas Paine said that or called for the creation of a republic, representative government based on natural rights of the people. And this is strongly influenced by the Enlightenment. So all of these ideas that we have here, natural rights, the idea of a republic, the idea of popular consent, came from Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke and Rousseau and in this case especially when you have individuals very brave such as Thomas Paine arguing for independence this becomes a norm this becomes an idea that spreads all over the country now let's look at the Declaration of Independence as you know the Declaration of Independence was drafted was written by Thomas Jefferson and the goal for the Declaration of Independence was to justify independence by listing the grievances that King George III had ignored for many of the colonists. The Declaration of Independence was also to rally support amongst the colonists. Remember, 
Many colonists were not in favor of going to war with Great Britain. Many of them were not in favor of fighting Great Britain. Also, the Declaration of Independence was there to get assistance from foreign nations. And we're going to see that later on when you get France involved in the conflict helping the colonists. The Declaration of Independence was also there to uh, broad appeal by declaring unalienable rights, natural rights, and the power of government to rest or rest with the people, which we know as popular sovereignty. In terms of colonial unity, you had two groups, basically. You had the patriots, who were those people that were on board. They wanted to become independent from Great Britain. They did not want to have anything to do with Great Britain anymore. And on the other hand, you had another group of people that were called the loyalists. The loyalists were those people that actually supported Great Britain. They were treated pretty bad. First of all, they were treated as traitors. Secondly, in many cases, their properties were taken away. They were basically harassed by the patriots. And about 80,000 of them emigrated from the United States. Please keep in mind that most colonists were neutral or apathetic in this particular conflict that was taking place. Now let's move on to England or Great Britain versus America or the 13 colonies. Let's look at British strength and colonial weaknesses. First, Great Britain was militarily and economically superior to the colonies. We know that. There was a, a whole bunch of power within Great Britain. Second, there was considerable loyalist opposition. And third, weak government under the Continental Congress and eventually the Articles of Confederation that were in favor of Great Britain. Now let's look at colonial strength. This also involves British weaknesses. First, colonists had greater familiarity with the land. They knew the land. They lived on the land versus Great Britain and its military. They were not so familiar with the land. So the colonists used what we know as guerrilla warfare. Also, there was a res resilient military and political leadership, in particular by George Washington. Also, there was an ideological commitment. The colonists felt that it was their right to become independent from Great Britain. They had tried to work things out with the British government, but the British government rejected almost everything they had asked for. And uh, lastly, there was eventual support from European allies, mainly France. As you know, France gave a whole bunch of assistance to the colonists. And uh, obviously, they were in search of gaining some type of benefit in the long run. Let's move on. The nation of France became a really good friend of the 13 colonies or the United States. But why was this? Well, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, France had hoped to regain its power in North America and in Europe. Among other reasons uh, for France to support the 13 colonies was basically to put an end to the British mercantile policies, which meant that there was going to be free trade with the colonies. Also, France was caught up in idealism and the Enlightenment ideas. Please remember also that Benjamin Franklin helped to negotiate the treaty between both nations. There was a formal alliance in 1778 that followed the Battle of Saratoga. And France actually provided the colonists with money, weapons, naval support, and at the same time, soldiers. But again, France obviously had its own agenda. They were very instrumental in making sure that the 13 colonists were able to defeat Great Britain. The Revolutionary War was a big conflict that was fought in many areas between the colonies. And here are some of the significant battles of the Revolutionary War. First, we have the Lexington and Concord battles on April 1775. Then we have Bunker Hill in June 1775. Then we have Trenton on December 1777, in which Washington crossed Delaware river and capture 1,000 Haitian soldiers. Then on October 1777, you had the Battle of Saratoga in which the British actually surrender and France joins the war on the side of the Americans. Later in the war, England focused war effort on the South. Loyalists and the high slave population were there. In this case, the British thought that the Loyalists were going to fight with them and also that 
many of the slaves were going to join uh, the British government and fight the Patriots. But um, unfortunately for the British, this did not fare so well. Then there was the Battle of Yorktown on October 1781, in which General Cornwallis surrenders to American and French troops. And there was also a French blockade at the sea during this particular time period. These were some of the significant battles of the Revolutionary War. Please keep that in mind. We're not going to in so many details, but we're just giving you basically the dates that you can use in order to write a report. You can use in order to put together a full outline and comprehension of the Revolutionary War. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed between the United States and Great Britain. Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay headed to Paris to negotiate an end to the Revolutionary War. The Treaty of Paris was really important because England recognized the United States as an independent nation. And also, England recognized the boundaries of the U.S. and those boundaries would extend to the Mississippi River, to Great Lakes, and all the way to Spanish Florida. But the Americans also had to make some concessions. And some of those included the Americans had to respect the right of loyalists. You know, those people that fought on the side of Great Britain, the Americans actually had to respect them. Also, debts owed to British creditors would be paid off. And this is basically the end of the Revolutionary War. And that the United States actually became fully independent after this treaty. Now let's move on to the political impact of the American Revolution. First, state constitutions abolished many of all the European laws and traditions. There were different ideas of what republicanism would mean. Many states eliminated property requirements for voting. However, the colonial elite remained in other states restricted political involvement. Most states did not have full democracy at this or during this time period. But the American Revolution inspired many other revolutions around the world, including France, which had helped the United States. Then you go on to Haiti. Haiti became independent. And then on top of that, you add many of the Latin American nations declared themselves independent from Spain. So the American Revolution had a massive political impact, not only within the North American part of the world, but also in the Latin American part of the world. Let's move on. Now let's look at the social impact of the American Revolution. Women in particular, they played a significant role as they were the ones maintaining the farms and the businesses while men were away fighting. Some of them became nurses who took care of those injured military personnel. Some of them became cooks which basically were there exposing their lives to danger to making sure that all military personnel were fed properly. The impact of the American Revolution. I don't know if you remember Abigail Adams, but she called for greater rights for women. Very important concept and idea around this time. And remember, those ideals were influenced by the Enlightenment thinkers. Also, the ideal of Republican motherhood became very important, which called on women to teach Republican values within the family. And uh, finally, for Native Americans, oftentimes they fought on the side of the British, but at the end of the day, many of them were seen as bad because remember, the Patriots were not happy with those people that were supporting the British government and soldiers. And many of the Natives actually fought on the side of the British and they were not seen with a good eye. And this obviously became part of the way that the colonists saw many of the Native American tribes. And also remember that the British had limited colonial settlements. And some of these settlements belonged to Native Americans. But now that the British was no longer there, this meant that the colonists could actually, or the Americans in this case, could actually get into those settlements where Native Americans had been living for hundreds of years. And this is basically a, a problem that continue for many, many generations. Continuing on with the social impact of the American Revolution, African Americans eventually were allowed to fight in the Continental Army. 
Following the American Revolution, there was gradual emancipation in the northern and middle states. Later on, slavery will expand into the south and adjacent western lands. This will create distinct regional attitudes towards slavery. But as you may recall, slavery will be protected in the Constitution, sadly. We have come to the end of this presentation. Please make sure to subscribe, and I will see you in the next presentation.